Hi, I'm Peggy Farron, and you're watching the Understand Photography Show, where we talk about travel, nature, and fine art photography. We're going to be talking with fine art photographer Rich Smuckler about getting your photography noticed. The Understand Photography Show is first a podcast, so if you're watching and wondering why we don't have any visuals, that's why, because we have a, a, a quite a large audience as a podcast, not quite the same on YouTube. So if you want to change that out, help us get some more subscribers on YouTube. <laughs> You can subscribe yourself, but of course, subscribing on iTunes, reviews on iTunes helps us more than anything. Be sure to sign up for one of the freebies on the Understand Photography site. So it's understandphotography.com, and you'll see right on the front page it says freebies. So click on that. We've got all kinds of good stuff, travel tips for photographers, which camera to buy, what do I need to learn as a photographer. So we give you like a little plan of action how to get tack sharp images every time. There's a lot on there, so check out our website at understandphotography.com. We also have a couple of Facebook groups uh, where you can share photos, tips, ask questions, you know, what kind of camera should, you know, what kind of lens should I buy, what, things like that, you know, I'm, I'm having trouble with my Lightroom, that kind of stuff. That would go on the Understand Photography group. So, um, facebook.com slash understandphotography, you'll see a link for the groups. The other group is selling your photography as art. So this show is going to be more relevant to that one. That is all about just tips and ideas and questions about selling your art. You, you, want, to, you want to become a fine art photographer. How do you do that? So that's our Facebook group about that. So I hope you'll join us on Facebook. So today, Rich Smuckler is my guest. Rich is a fine art photographer whose work is shown in galleries and museums around the world, and he's, uh, his work, of course, is in the homes of many collectors. So welcome. <laughs> welcome, Rich. Hi, Peggy. <laughs> it, it's an honor being here. Thank you. And as a disclaimer, I might add that I've made almost every mistake you can make, so the tips that I might give today will be helpful, but you have to seek your own level to make sure you get it right. So. Ah, good point, good point. But you know what? I'm, I listen to all these podcasts. I like motivational stuff, you know. And the whole one today was all about failing. How important failing is to, succe to success. Because if you're not out there trying things, you know you're not going to succeed. And if you're out there trying things, you're going to fail. <laughs> no, I, I think that's absolutely true. <laughs> and uh, sometimes we have a happy accident and things work out that we don't plan. That's true. And uh, how many shots you never thought were going to work out, just do and vice versa. So you have to keep going out there and trying your best and see what happens. Now give us the very short version of your life story as it pertains to photography. The short, short, short version. Right. <laughs> My mom and dad gave me a brownie Hawkeye when I was about five years old and that's it. I've been going for it ever since. <laughs> and you have... Uh, quite a diverse portfolio, but you're kind of known for your abstract photography. Is that true? I, I think that's the truly unique portfolio aspect of my work. That's my abstract expressionism. Though, if you look on my website, you'll see that I do have a lot of travel photography, uh, a lot of fine art photography, which is sort of an umbrella for everything I believe I do. And um, general abstract work as well. The abstract stuff is really cool. And what's your website? Rich Smuckler Photo at yahoo.com. It's my email address. And if you just Google Rich Smuckler Photo, you'll find it. You'll come up? Yeah. Okay. And we'll have, of course, we'll have the link on our, our show yeah. notes. All right, so what are some of the ways that we can get our work out there? <clears throat> well, I think that you need to start off with three elements. You have to have a good business card. That's purely subjective, but uh, the old saw is that you only have one chance to make a first impression. So when you're introducing yourself to collectors or gallerists or museums, um, you need to have a card that might catch somebody's eye. Uh, you should have a first-rate professional portfolio book. And by book, I mean an actual text which has uh, maybe 20 or 30 of your best pieces that will wow the viewer immediately. 
you can have that made professionally or you can try to do it yourself, but I recommend you have somebody do it for you. So are you, could you go to um, like Blurb or something for a book like that? I, I've used them. I've used several others. I'm not going to hawk either one of them. My wife happens to be a graphic designer, so I'm very fortunate that way. Oh, uh, yeah. And so she can work with those particular platforms. If anybody out there has any questions, just email me and I'll hook you up with my wife. She'll tell you how to do it or she can do it for you. But uh, I don't think that these books should have pictures of you chimping uh, while you're at the Grand Canyon. It needs to be your artwork and it needs to show uh, who you are as a fine art photographer. So that's number two. And three and probably most important these days is a, a very strong professional website. Okay. Because that is your first impression to most people, is yeah, the website. The, yeah, the website. Or the card, I guess the business card. I have to tell you a business card story, and I, I gosh, I wish I could remember this woman's name. But I was, I was at the car mechanic, okay, and who has, you know, been my mechanic for 25 years, and uh, he's such a nice guy, and he's got lots of regular customers. So this woman comes in, and he said, oh, and he introduced us, and she hands me her card, and it's this metal card with her logo, you know, um, like a hole, I can't think of what I'm trying to say. It's not etched but because it's an actual hole with her logo and then it, and I was like, oh my gosh, my first thing is, how much did this cost you? <laughs> she said, well, at first they were pretty expensive, but you know, the more you'd get, the less expensive. And she's got them down to $2.50 each. I said, that's kind of a lot of money for a business card. She said, will you ever throw this away? And I said, no, I never will throw this away. And she was right, I never have. I showed it to everybody. I showed her her card. So that's kind of interesting advice that you say, have a good business card, because I didn't realize until she really wowed me with that business card, I never really thought, I mean, it's, I knew it was important to have a card, but I didn't realize that you could be wowed like she wowed me. Think, think about these mailers that you get every day. Uh, through the post and they say that you have about two or three seconds to gain somebody's attention otherwise psh, it gets tossed and with so much commerce out there and people trying to grab for everybody's dollars it, it's important to get someone to look at you that extra second uh, the the portfolio book is another thing you have to wow them with the first couple of pages. Now, what size do you think that book should be? I like uh, coffee table size, something pretty big. So like a maybe like a 12 by 12 yeah. or? M maybe even 12 by 16, something oh, okay. like that. Okay, okay, yeah, because yeah. bigger it makes more impact. Yeah, and I, I like to have one photo per page or sometimes one photo per spread. Okay, when you're like opening a panel. Up. Yeah, uh, I, I know that you want to get all your stuff in there, but maybe just 20 or 30 pieces and make sure they're sharp and they're, they tell your story. Okay. Very important. But I do believe that, at least in this day and age, the website is, is very, very important. Yeah. It's, uh, it's really your calling card. If you can't meet with a gallerist in California and you're here in Florida, a nice opening email introductory letter along with a link to your website page uh, serves as a, a way to be introduced. In, in the past, we would go into galleries with these huge portfolios with paintings and yep. photos and all kinds of stuff. Now I walk in with my card and my book and that's it. And sometimes, and be prepared to do this, if you really want to get into a particular gallery, be prepared to leave your book behind and ask the gallerist if you can come get it in a week or so. Will that be enough time for you to go over my stuff? Oh, good, good advice. Now, th these books are not inexpensive, so you don't want to give them out too freely, but it's something you may want to consider. Yeah. The website has at least three major functions. You may want to use it as a, an e-commerce site. You always want to sell your work if you can. Okay. Uh, it's introductory, of course, but then it, it also, if you have good presence on the web, people can find you and get exposure through your site. Another thing with 
May I talk a little bit about what you should look for in a site? Yeah. You want to make sure that you can get some immediate impact when people come to your site. Uh, it has to be easily navigated because most people out there don't have the patience to, to go through a difficult site. And if they have a tough time opening your site, you're toast. It's gone. I agree. And you need to have a wow factor early on on the home page. Or once again, consider the number of sites that gallerists are going through when they're looking for people who want to get into their studios and galleries. Yeah. So it, it's got to hit you quickly and it's got to hit you well. And uh, that's very important. I have a, a blog that I link to my site. I have a little advertising piece in regard to teaching that I do, photography classes. Um, I, I break the site into different groupings, the expressionism, the travel, and so forth, and I try to keep it pretty simple so people can find their way through. Okay, okay. Um, by the way, to the audience, we have a show, really good show, with Carolyn Edlin, and Heather's going to have to put them in the show notes because I don't know the number, the, the show number, but um, that we talked a lot of detail about an artist website. It's a really, you know, Carolyn Edlin is a, do you know her? I She's do not. an art business consultant, mm -hmm. and uh, it was a really good show. A lot, a lot of good stuff in there about the website because the website is really important. So, well, how do we make our work interesting enough to set it apart from everyone else? Or how do we set it apart from everyone else? I mean, that, you know, that's one of the problems that, you know, we've been doing this show for almost three years now, and we're starting to look at photographers' work, and it's all starting to look the same to us because, like you said, the gallerists are doing the same thing. If they've got all these photographers, if it all looks the same, you're just kind of like, oh, another landscape photographer and you know, whatever. Yeah, that's a, a huge question. I've given a lot of thought to it over the years. And I think you need to start off with understanding that an artist needs to have a unique body of work that's recognizable and is growing. What I mean by that, if I can talk a little bit about it. If you consider the great masters, Van Gogh with his swirly yeah. paint strokes, Degas and the pointillistic impressionists, uh, if you take a look at Kandinsky and his later works, which we know for his curly cues and splash art, and, and for the fine art photographers as well. Uh, if you look at any of the great artists' works, there's something about their stuff that is so recognizable as they develop as artists, mm -hmm. but something that says, oh, that, that's an early Van Gogh, or that's, that isn't to say from time to time you embark on a different area where there might be some uh, different qualities to that particular artists work but overall you can recognize a fine artists work over the years now that the element that to me is so important is the ability of an artist to have the guts to to develop beyond a successful area of work that they've been working on at that time what I mean by that is artists who have gained some recognition sometimes get caught in the mud because they're making a little money uh -huh. and they're afraid to move out of their wheelhouse. Uh -huh. I have little respect for those artists. The ones who I truly admire are the ones that can maintain some recognizability of their work but are able to say, I'm going to push this a little further and try something else and, and see how far I can take it so I can satisfy my creative needs, not the fact that you want a, a, a mauve pelican on top of my couch or something like that. 
It's hard for photographers, though, because most of us like to take everything. Like, we all like to take travel photography. All, all of us like that. And we like to take pictures of interesting people with cool lighting. And it's, it's hard to differentiate yourself. Now, you found a niche with the abstract stuff, which is really, really cool. Um, for me, I've got, like, infrared stuff that see, people seem to like. But I, I, I like it but I don't love it, you know what I mean? So I don't feel the passion stirring me with the infrared stuff that seems to, but it seems to be the thing that sells for me. So you have little respect for me from saying that, I know, but... <laughs> but I mean, it's, I don't just do that because it's not, it's, I mean, I like it. Don't get me wrong, I really, really like it. Well, well, this I just like everything. Yeah. That's my problem, and I think that's most photographers' problems. Well, I, I think you have to grow up, Peggy. Ah! <laughs> I mean, that, that isn't to say <laughs> that you can't take the sucker shot. I mean, I mean, there I was in front of the Flatiron Building in New York City, and there was a beautiful iconic clock down on the street and I wanted to shoot a black and white of that that corner shot of the Flatiron building but I still managed to place the clock on an angle as I'm looking up to that building in a way that I satisfied my own fine art creative need to make a good piece. Mm. I may have taken 20 or 30 of those shots, but the ones that I chose are the ones that I thought still fell within the area where I could respect myself in trying to do something unique and, and new. Th that shot was probably done a million times, but... For you it was But, but for new. me it was the first time, yeah. and I, I made it mine. Yeah. And instead of just taking a snapshot, I try to look at every piece that I take as a piece of fine art Okay. and try to create my own personal masterpiece, not just taking a snapshot. I think one of the things I see too is as people grow as photographers and their skill set gets better, so does their photography. The more you know, the more creative you can be in a certain situation. You know, you know how to do lens flare or starburst or slow shutter. When you know how to do all that stuff, you have a lot more options when you're looking at that clock than somebody who really is just shooting an aperture priority or something, right? The other thing that I see about portfolio, and I just thought of this while we were talking, because Joe Fitzpatrick, as you know, works here. He's been really you know, motivated to try to edit some of his pictures and get them on Facebook and Instagram. And his editing skills are getting to be amazing. And he's coming up with a look just from his editing skills, which is another skill to learn. The more skills you have, the more unique I think that you can be as a photographer. Right on. You need at least three areas to, to get to be a good photographer. You've got to learn your camera inside out. That's one. You have to know your computer inside out. Yeah. <laughs> you know? And in any of the different platforms you're going to use to edit within that framework. And you have to learn how to be a good printer. Now that was something when I, because I visited you at your house in Palm Beach Gardens. Is that where you live? Palm Beach? Yes. Yeah. And you had this massive printer and you had a light box and you had the whole thing because you are really picky about the printing, aren't you? You can't control someone else's printer. Okay. You can control your own. You could also throw a lot of your stuff away, but you can't throw it away when you go to Costco. You order it, you look at it, you have it. Maybe you'll go back again, maybe you'll go back a third time. But at least when you're printing at home, you can control the, the color, you can redo it, you can try different types of textures of, of papers. Okay. You can try 10 different papers, you could try cloth, you can, uh, I can't print on metals myself, I, I farm that out, but uh, I've had works printed on silk. So you can try all different types yeah. of things, but only you can do it yourself. And I, I know that's a, that's a whole art form in and of itself, but, <laughs> but if you have the time and if you really care about 
the art form of photography, printing is huge. Really? Okay. I, uh, I used to print my own, but I, I hated it. I hated that part because it's technical. It's very technical. Well, there's two sides. It's technical, but... It's artistic, it's too. artistic too. Maybe if I would learn that, just like photography, I had a hard time learning the technical side of photography. And as soon as I learned it, I'm like, first of all, I was kind of mad at all the teachers out there because it's not that hard. Maybe it's the same with, way with printing. I just need to find the right teacher to teach me how to do the printing because I found it very difficult with all the profiles. And yeah. if, if George the Wolf is out there and if he's still teaching, he taught over at Palm Beach uh, Photo Center for a long time. I'm not sure he's here. George the Wolf? George the Wolf. Oh, the Wolf. D, D, I thought you said the. George, George <laughs> D, D E Wolf. Uh, he's a tremendous teacher and mentor. and uh, You can even look up his books on printing black and white and color. And okay. He's superior. Ah, good to know. All right, so let's go back. So what about to promoting your, your, your artwork? So do you recommend um, sharing pictures on, like, Instagram, 500 pics, Flickr, I don't know what else, there's so many at this point. I, I'm sure they're all good. I don't do any of those. Uh, I do Facebook and that's it. And I, again, folks, I'm sure you could have greater impact if you use all these other platforms. I just don't. And uh, I, I introduce people through my my website and uh, and Facebook. I have a Facebook page and I have a blog and they're all interrelated. And now how, how often do you blog? I only maybe once a month. Okay, but you consistently do it once a yeah. month. Yeah. That's what they say, it doesn't really matter as off, you know, like once a month, but as long as you do it every month. But if you do it once every six months, you probably shouldn't have a blog at all. That's what I read. Well, you want people people to stay somewhat yeah, interacting with you. Yeah, and uh, someone else, and I did this, said don't put dates on your blog because boy, before you know it, it says 2012 on there and, yeah. <laughs> and somebody will go, wow, this person doesn't ever update this. Well, Word, WordPress <laughs> is a good blog page platform and uh, they'll create on the right side of the column of your blog an archive where you can link to past blogs. And like blog articles, you mean? Yeah. Okay. Yours and others if you want to link to someone else as well. Okay. So that's the way you can go. So how do you get people to read your blog? I mean, how do they know about it? Well, one thing you can do is, unless you're an expert in SEO, search engine optimization, which, which I am not, <laughs> uh, you can hire somebody to, to backlink your website so that people will find your website and find you and find you on your Facebook page and you'll have cross links between your web page, your blog page and your Facebook pages and uh, hopefully that'll get you a little bit of, of action. So you hired somebody to do that for you? I, well, I hired somebody to do the SEO optimization. Okay, and that's my, what they did, is did the backlinks and... Right. Okay, how much does that cost, like if I wanted to get that done? About as much money as you have. Ah! <laughs> <laughs> so it, it can be expensive, but I, it, I think to do a simple uh, job for most of your SEO companies, 500 to to $1,000. Okay. All this costs money. It's Everything, that, that, I know. That's the problem. Promotions and can really cost yeah, money. You, you have to kind of draw the line at some point. For me, when we put a new blog article out, or, you know, we do a, we do a training video every Tuesday, and, of course, we have the show, so we promote it via social media is one way. But my newsletter, and anyone who listens to this show knows I talk about my newsletter a lot, I put a newsletter out once a month, and of course it'll have like the first three or four sentences of the blog article and click here to read the rest. And that is the best way that I get people to read my blog is because there are already people who had subscribed to my newsletter or I have some kind of attachment to. So they start and they'll click on it to read the blog. And I do it too. I, have, I follow s several artists who aren't even photography artists. I just want to see what they're doing because they're successful artists. 
and they all have a newsletter. And I read, you know, a lot of them will click over to the website, click yeah. over to the website. So I do that often. You need to be creative, and I think your creativity uh, has to spill into how you advertise yourself. Good point. And I think that depending on your community and where you are within your profession and the state of your photography uh, will differ from person to person. I, I recently had an ad prepared. I was approached by one of these uh, local newspapers. Mm -hmm and they had access to uh, all of these country club communities in North Palm Beach, Florida. And they said, for so much money, we'll help you prepare an ad that will go to 5,000 homes. Mm -hmm. In addition to that, we'll give you a, a JPEG or a PDF of the ad, which you can use any way that you want. So I thought about it and I, I decided to do it. And I find that the most valuable tool was not so much the ad going to the homes of these various people, but to take the JPEG or the PDF and then create a little emailer with the JPEG embedded in, in the mail so that it opens upon receipt. Immediate. Okay. And I've sent it to dozens of uh, designers and interior decorators oh. in the area. So it's like a second form of using the first batch of information. You know, it's funny because I did a very similar thing and I forgot about that. I got a call. We have a, a, a TV show. Oh, crap. Hold on. I got to find the name in my head. Out and about Southwest Florida. And it's a paid TV show. So you pay and they give you like a three-minute you know, infomercial maybe, I guess yeah, it is. Yeah. And uh, she said it was $500. And oh, you'll be on ABC TV at 11 o'clock on Sunday. Nobody ever, ever, ever has seen it on TV. But they gave me the video for $500, a professionally made three minute video. I thought that was an amazing bar. I mean, I don't know how much it costs now because that was a few years ago. But I did it twice because the video was so good. <laughs> you know, it was like a free ad. Well, it wasn't free, it was a $500 ad. But to get a professional video done for $500 is pretty doggone yeah. good price. Now, this relates back to something you said earlier in the show about failing and mm. not being afraid to fail. Don't be afraid to have people say no. It, you're, you're not going to get into every show, you're not going to get into every gallery, not everybody's going to buy your photography, but you have to keep throwing this stuff up on the wall. Yeah. And see what happens, and some, sometimes it'll stick. And sometimes I waste money. I waste a lot of money trying things that don't work out. <laughs> I, 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 I'm not sure if it's really wasting it. It, it may be planting a seed. Yeah. If somebody compared it to, well, when you see an ad on a billboard going down the highway. You may not be buying uh, ABC widgets the first time you see it, but maybe the 20th time your, your plumbing is leaking, you say, oh, oh maybe, yeah, maybe, you remember I, I, I remember that name. So you got to kind of keep throwing yourself out there. And it's a little humiliating and frustrating and depressing at times. You're thinking, how the heck am I going to get any of this done? But sometimes it works. I find complaining and whining works if you complain and whine to the correct people. Because let me just tell you a couple stories. One of them, well, they both have to do with the, I've been the cover photographer for a local magazine for, I don't even, like 15 years. It's a monthly job, but I barter for ads. And when I first started, I had a very large children's photography business. I got lots of stuff out of the ad. Well, over the years, the children's photography business is just, the, the money is not in it like it used to be. And I've kind of moved on. But I, I really like the job. But I'm sitting there thinking, why am I continuing to do this? Because the ads are not working for me anymore. And so I was kind of whining to the owner, who's a new owner. And um, well, she's not that new anymore, I guess. She came up with an idea to just starting writing ph photography tips instead of just an ad. I write little, it's like a column, kind of like another infomercial, I guess. And uh, I've only done it once so far. but. I've actually gotten 
some recognition. I haven't gotten any work out of it that I know, but people have were a lot more interested in that than all the different ads I've come up with all over the years. So sometimes your little bit of whining gives you some good ideas. Well, <laughs> I think that tips is sometimes a much more valuable tool than a 2,000 word newsletter. We don't have the time. We, <clears throat> we're not interested. We, we want to move on to something else. But if you see a tip that rings a bell, then maybe that's more important. But as fine art photographers, we're not really selling, I mean, you and I are selling photography classes, but these people who don't really want to get into teaching, they just want to sell their artwork, what kind of tips could they put in something? That's a hard one, right? You know what I think really works in a newsletter is stories about your artwork. You know, when I went to take this picture, you know, I only had two inches and I had to squeeze into this little cubby, but I knew the perspective was going to be right or something like that. I think people are interested in hearing. Like, you know, when we first met and you were talked about how you came up with some of these abstract pictures was fascinating to me. Like you did an oil drum. I'm like, how did you see a cool picture out of an oil drum? <laughs> Your story was interesting to me. I have two sides to that take. On the one hand, I'm glad that the backstory is interesting, but I truly believe that the piece has to stand on its own. And if you walked into a museum or a gallery, I'm not really interested in reading about the piece. Maybe I want to see how much it costs and who the artist is, but I, I want the piece to speak to me personally. Okay. Now, when you're trying to sell a piece to somebody, if you've drawn them into that point and they're looking at your artwork, then I think the backstory becomes valuable. <laughs> I've taken the approach not so much in my blog to tell, I, I've done both sides of it. I, I, I've talked about the story behind getting the piece, but I think that to provide information to people about photography is, is giving them something as opposed to talking too much about yourself. Okay, okay. So, um, I, I've seen both sides, I've done both sides. I prefer now to give people information, tell them everything I know about photography, and if they can use it, great. And that may bring them back to uh, read my, my blog next month, as opposed to talking about my feelings the morning I got up to, to shoot yeah, at yeah, 30 degree weather yeah. or something like that. And one of the things that I learned from doing I've done a <laughs> newsletter for almost 18 years and it was quarterly and now it's been monthly for at least 10 years, I don't even know. But uh, when I first started I had a hard time coming up with ideas on what to write. But now, I, I mean the more you do it the more ideas that you have. Yeah. All right, so let's talk about, now you, when you started selling your art, you started in, with competitions, am I right? Yes. So let, let's talk about competitions, because that's a good way to get your name out there, isn't it? I think so. So, think go ahead, so. Tell, yeah. tell me something about competitions. <laughs> Again, don't be uh, afraid to lose, because you're gonna lose a lot. Do you, does it, I mean, how do, the, how do you get rejected if you, do they send you a letter or do, you, do they just, you just don't hear anything? No, they'll send you an email or sometimes they'll send you a physical letter reje of rejection. But now, today, everything is almost via email. Yeah. The, the reason I believe that the competitions have some value is to start to create a, a credibility factor for your background. Okay. When you're first starting, let's assume you've never been in any show anywhere and never in a gallery, you're new at this, and you apply to uh, a local museum competition, uh -huh. and you get in. Now, under your name, you're now in Naples Art Association Museum Right, so you've got a little credibility. Yeah. Next year you get into a couple more. And, a few and you more. don't even have to win, you just have to get in, right? Correct. That's I cool. Mean, you just tell them what you did. And after a while I think that 
you get a presumption. What I mean by that is if you have been in a half a dozen major shows, solo, group, won some awards, been in some publications, whatever it is you do to get yourself exposed out there. Uh, I think even the gallerists are swayed and persuaded by your background and it gives them some room for pause when they say, well, God, he won the Naples Art Association, yeah. this or um, Museum of Modern, Modern, Modern Art or whatever, and they, they look at you and they say, well, let me look at this a little bit longer. Right, right. I think credibility, building up your credibility is important and it's hard. It's not that hard. You just have to get out there and get rejected. Like you said, you got to keep, like, enter those contests yeah. and, and, and you don't have to win. You can, well, the contests, you have to win something, right? Well, or it, you don't get any recognition it, it, it at all. It varies. It varies. They're, they're but some of them are just, you're just entering a competition to, to get into a show. Exactly. You're entering a competition to get into a group show. For so instance, what sorry. kind of, what, so there's competitions to get into a show, to get into museums. Yeah, galleries. Galleries. Galleries have competitions. Absolutely. Um, right here in Naples, I've been in three of the shows here. Okay. It's beautiful. And they have great food, super food. But we have incredible caterers yeah, in Naples. <laughs> really. So I mean, it, you may uh, find five thousand people have applied to get into a show where there are only twenty-five pieces being shown. Okay. So in your blog, you can say, "I'm proud to say that my piece has been uh, accepted into the local show here." I was one of 25 artists, 5,000 people applied. We're having a show next Friday night. Please come and take a look. Now those pieces will probably be for sale. And uh, the pieces that are being shown, there'll be awards given to the top three or four pieces within that show. Mm -hmm. So there is further opportunity as, as it unfolds. Okay, that's awesome. Okay, so see, I didn't know I guess I kind of knew, but until I t really talked to you, I didn't realize how often museums have competitions. Because I think, you know, getting, and maybe this is just my own prejudice, but getting, a, getting into an art association seems easier than getting into a museum. Because an art association's job is to help you as an artist succeed. A museum, that's not their job. Their job is to make sure they have good enough artists for people to come in and see. Their so, job is also to encourage the public to come and see their works, to get involved. And so you have to be museum. better to get in a museum. It's, that's my mindset. I don't know if it's true. Well, they're small museums. They're yeah, that's true. Museums. That's a good point. Some museums don't have competitions. Some have several a year. Uh, you have to spend some time online. And that, do you you had didn't you tell me about a website that has a lot of competitions? So there are do oh, dozens. Okay. Uh, just to rattle off a couple, there's Photo Insider. Photo Insider. There's Cafe Entry. And if you just Google art shows, art competitions, photography competitions, photographers don't just think your work is non-artistic and only photographic work. Uh, I've had my works in competitions and shown with, with other uh, oil paintings and abstract uh, 2D sculptures, 3D sculptures, and what have you. So uh, don't limit yourself. And if you spend a little time online, you're going to find dozens and dozens of shows that are looking for artists to participate. Go to your local museum. Go to your local gallerists. See what's available, and you'll be amazed. Most of these competitions cost money to apply towards. Sometimes fifteen, twenty-five, fifty dollars. So after a while that begins to add up. You, you want to figure out what your budget is and it also takes time. So uh, you have to consider what your goals are and how to get there. So h how do you choose how to start? And if Okay, so I say I'm, I'm ready, I'm gonna go. How do I choose the right competition for me? Well, you're not going to apply to uh, 
a show that is exclusively devoted to birds if, yeah. <laughs> if you're just shooting fish, yeah, unless yeah. it's a flying fish. I guess. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but uh, most of the competitions will uh, designate the type of work they okay. want. Some will say general, some will say landscape only, some will be black and white, some will be um, portrait work. Okay. So it, 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 a lot of it is a, it's a reading test. You have to make sure that you send the right work to the right competition. And, and But you know what, let me just stop you because that is something that so many people skim through rules and they need to read them. They need to read them because they all are different what they're looking for. But go ahead, I'm sorry. Uh, it, it's also a little tricky at first to format the image the way the particular show wants you to send it to them as. Yeah. That they'll want you to send it as a JPEG with so many pixels on one side, so many on the other, and some will want a resume, some will want a statement, some don't want that. Uh, some will want it on a disk, some will just take it via the email. Yeah. So uh, you have to spend time, and after a while you're going to realize there are certain shows that just fit into your wheelhouse uh, that you want to go to that you want to participate in. But remember, if this is a show that's going to physically take your artwork and put it up on a wall, uh, there's a tremendous cost in printing, framing, shipping. Maybe it sells, maybe it doesn't. So then there's return shipping. Oh, yeah. And then there's storage. After yeah. your piece comes back from the show or the shows, what do you do with it? Do you donate it? Do you throw it away? Do you do you put it into a storage unit? Yeah. Like I have? <laughs> Is that what you've done? Yeah, run out of room in the house. You know, <laughs> the storage unit. But uh, you have to consider what's happening down the road with this, and uh, there are a lot of thoughts that go into that. Yeah, that's process. that's good though. I hadn't thought that through all the way about the printing costs and all that kind of stuff. So it's probably a good idea to try to start local wherever you live, do you think? Or? I would think so, yeah. Okay. And making a, known for your, a, a name for yourself locally can never hurt you. No. What, um, do you have any tips about like getting in? Like is there a certain type of image that judges look for? Or what, what would like automatically disqualify people? Yeah, a, a, um, let's see. I would think that an image sent to a competition that is out of focus, that you have a landscape where the horizon line is not, off, not straight. Not straight when it needs to be straight. Uh, a failure to meet the technical guidelines of the image. I, I actually heard a, a, a judge talk about what would immediately get wiped out. You know, uh -huh. they'll, they'll be getting uh, a thousand applications and they'll take 200 immediately because these folks can't figure out how to send the JPEG in properly. So they just, they don't send them back to you and say, do it right. They just You toss just get it, disqualified. Toss it. And that's usually because they didn't read the rules. Exactly. That's why I stopped you in the middle yeah. of that because I'm a judge at the Naples Art Association and it's amazing to me how many people don't read the rules. <laughs> you know, if, if it's supposed to be portrait, but someone sends it to you in a landscape and yeah, exactly. it's off on the edge, or it's and you and you know what, a hundred percent for sure. The main reason things got immediately out is because a horizon or straight the line isn't straight where it should be. That is that is the most common mistake that we see. It's crazy how often people do that. And one of the things that even if you know your horizon's straight but your verticals are, you know, it's so easy in Lightroom and Photoshop nowadays to straighten your lines. Well, to snap, yeah. So that's something people need to learn how to do. <laughs> well, if, if you're a serious photographer, you gotta, you gotta get your background developed in, in how to, to edit your, your piece as well. Yes. And Lightroom is 
fantastic. Yeah. I mean, we all started with Photoshop before Lightroom was around, and then when Lightroom came around for us photographers, it was like someone gave us a gift from upstairs. It was amazing. Except I have a love-hate relationship with Lightroom, but because <laughs> I do love it, and I also hate it because it gets it frustrates me more than any software I've ever used. <laughs> well, well it, it, it wouldn't hurt you to take a a week course on it. Well, you know, I call Joe. I'm so spoiled because Joe is like the Lightroom guru, and uh, I forgot to synchronize my, the time on my cameras one time, so they were you know, the time wasn't the same and they weren't lining up how I wanted from two cameras. I called Joe and he goes, you know, we have a video on YouTube for that. <laughs> it's like, it's your company. <laughs> yeah. well, for, for those of us in South Florida, at least over on the East Coast, you have uh, Jim Zuckerman, you have Lawrence Gartell. They're, I think they're still teaching over at Palm Beach Photo and they gave a tremendous week-long workshops on, on Lightroom. Yeah. Certainly something to consider. Mine seem to be pretty unique though because I seem to stump even Joe. And Joe, I've never met anybody who knows more about Lightroom than Joe. And sometimes, I think it's just because I have so many hard drives that I kind of get screwed up sometimes. Just, you know, I go through, I, I don't like to have hard drives that are too big. But, but there's, you know, several people who work in my company and who take pictures. So we take three to 5,000 pictures a week. So I don't want anything too big as hard drives crash, so I'll have a one terabyte. And I go through one every three or four months. So then when you pull one out from a year ago, for some reason the catalogs don't work right. And you know, anyway, that seems to be my. That's for another hour. Yeah, that's Ar archiving and getting everything straight. Uh, all right, so 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 okay, so let's say I, I go to this competition, it's at the um, you know, does the Palm Beach Beach Photographic Center, they have competitions I would imagine. They do, yeah, they've several. Okay, years. so let's say I, I get in. What do I how can I capitalize on that? I mean, do I put it in my newsletter on right. Facebook or Yes, yes. Answer. Website. Yes. <laughs> Go have a glass of wine, enjoy yourself, and get anybody to talk about it you can. Get a local newspaper to run it, anything at all. Just hey, get no, it out there. Now stop right there. So what about a press release? Could you put a press release out and say local artist? I create my own press releases, and I call that my blog. In other words, ah. I, I'll, I'll, I'll create the blog piece as a press release. Rich Smuckler is proud to show that ABC piece was just exhibited at the so-and-so museum. Ah. 7,000 artists failed to get into the show, but he was there. You know, okay. So create something, and uh, it, it's a little bit embarrassing sometimes to blow your own horn, but that's what this is all about. Yeah, I know. It's difficult be for me, but I'm getting better at it. Yeah, because if you're shy about taking pictures of people close, which a lot of photographers are, that's somewhat similar as I think about it to blowing your own horn and, and talking about your photography and trying to get people interested in it. So you have to get over that or you're not going to be able to be successful presenting yourself to the world. Yeah, yeah, I agree with that. Being here. I mean, as a young man, I probably would be stammering and Twitching and I've had a it's, few people really hard. nervous. It's hard. Yeah. And so it's for me. It was public speaking when I first started teaching. I knew I had to get over my fear of public speaking, and it was really hard for me. Yeah, and I, I mean, I got over it. I, it's, it's hard. My background was a trial lawyer, so oh, so you're used to it. Yeah. Now I am. But as a young man, I was scary. Yeah, we're very scared. I, I took. I remember taking a course in Tuscany years ago where the, the subject matter dealt exclusively with portraits of people. And we only had about six people in the workshop. The, the goal was you had a week. You were to go into a little town anywhere at all and come back with five images that told a story about a person that okay. you didn't know. Uh -huh. and, um, 
most of us couldn't speak Italian. I was going to say, and that's a different language, yeah. too. <laughs> so a lot of waving of the arms. And so uh, there was one fella in the class who, he was a southern boy, and I guess he was brought up more polite than some of us. And he finally admitted after the second or third day that he just could not get the gumption up to get close to somebody and take a shot. Now, if I'm across the room and you're using a longer lens, anybody can do that. But the goal of the class was to tell a story. So you had to do something more personal with that person right. to, to be able to, uh, to get into their lives. And that meant approaching them and learning about them and taking close-in shots and things like that. He finally said, I can't do it. And the teacher gave him another subject to work on. But uh, so that is something you have to get over if you're going to become a portrait-like, an, an action portrait photographer. But then if you're going to make yourself the action of your own story and tell, your, tell people about who yeah. you are and what your pieces are all about, you're going to have to get over that too. Yeah, that's something that at least I think my generation, we were taught that not to brag and to be humble, and, and it's, it's difficult. It's difficult to say, look at me, look at me, look at me. It's, it's hard. You know, I, I think, okay, I've got to get my social media going. I'm like, well, who cares what I had to eat today and, you right. know, whatever. But people do. I, I, I see that I, not so much what they eat, but, you know, we had a guy on the show, he came from Miami, Eden Chavez. In fact, he's going to be on again very shortly. I just interviewed him. Um, but the first time he came, he took a video of himself coming over. He put a little video camera, like a GoPro or something, and took video of, of this, you know, when I was interviewing him. Then he went to the sunset with Joe, and they shot some, you know, sunset pictures the whole time he was talking about what he was doing and then he edited it and put it on YouTube and I found it really interesting then I started watching other videos he had in there just of like I'm going to take a trip to the Keys and he forgot something so he had to drive back and you know I, I just it was funny because I thought well this is interesting to me so why can't I do this I have to you know force myself to say look at me here's what I'm doing today <laughs> <laughs> what we're realize, realizing how many truly fabulous photographers are out there. Photographers who I will hands down say are much better than me. Uh, who really haven't gotten their foot in the door. And so many photographers who are not as good as me. Who are having some commercial success that I have not been able to achieve. So it isn't necessarily the quality of your photography if your aim is to have some financial success at this. Yeah. I, I think you have to keep the eye on the prize and that's be as good a photographer as you can, try to enjoy it and be creative and then see if you can sell one here and there and it makes it more enjoyable. Got to get out there. So, okay, five tips for getting your images noticed. You have any five tips in your head? Well, let me think about that. Well, the competitions, I think, are a good one. Well, gallery competitions, museum competitions, online competitions. Um, get to know your local interior designers and decorators. Oh, yeah, we didn't touch on that. And see if you can hook up with uh, your local newspaper cultural and, and art columns. And how would you do that? Get on the phone, go to the paper, uh, look online, see who is writing the columns, see if you can talk to them, see if you can email them. 99 out of 100 times they won't get back to you, but every once in a while somebody will pick up a story. Go to your school. I, I've had some pretty good pickups from my undergraduate college. Penn State wrote a couple of really nice articles about me when uh -huh. I had a, had a uh, show in Tuscany. Okay. And, uh, and then, of course, you want to pull a couple strings. If, uh, if your local gallerist who you might be working with is advertising, then see if you can get them to put a piece 
about you that you're coming into the gallery and to talk to the people who will be investing and purchasing art through that gallery. That's a good idea too. I don't know if that's five. There might be more. I'm not I sure. know. I, I lost count, but that was pretty good. <laughs> so where can the, our, our audience find you? What's your website? richsmucklerphoto.com. Rich Smuckler, and it's S-M-U-K-L-E-R. Photo.com. Is that like the, uh, isn't Smuckler's a jelly or something? I wish. No, that's spelled differently. Oh, it's spelled differently. <laughs> <laughs> You're not a trust fund baby, huh? <laughs> Well, thank you for being on the show. It's been great. I really enjoyed nice it. Nice to see you. <laughs> and thanks to the audience for watching. Um, I hope you'll do us a big favor and leave us a review on iTunes if you're enjoying the podcast. If you have suggestions for guests or topics, just let me know at Peggy at understandphotography.com. Rich? RichSmuckler at Yahoo.com. Please, anybody, contact me anytime. I'll be glad to get back to you with any information that I have. Awesome. Thanks for watching the Understand Photography Show. I'm Peggy Farron. Yeah.